Longtime sideman for Helen Shapiro, male model, child poet, and first of the East End mods before the breed had yet been given a name by the press, Marx has been a checkered life. The first time I heard music seriously, he recalls, was through my dad, who worked in Petticoat Lane and used to bring me records home. The first I had was Ballad of Davy Crockett by Bill Hayes. I played it all the time until my dad came home one day and said, I've got this new Bill Hayes record for you. I was so thrilled, but then I looked at the cover and there was this guy jumping around with a guitar. I said, but dad, this isn't Bill Hayes, this is Bill Haley. It was a real downer. But I played it. Rock around the clock, see you later alligator. Wow, what's this? Bill Hayes got thrown right out of the window. Apart from serving as a kid at the famed 21's coffee bar, where he can remember Cliff Richard being thrown out for jamming in the downstairs room, Boland's next brush with the temptingly attractive world of rock and roll occurred at the Hackney Empire, where the television show Oh Boy was being filmed weekly and where the rock stars of the day could be seen and idolized, and later imitated in front of the mirror at home, guitar clutch to breast. Mark eventually joined a local outfit glorying under the name of Susie and the Hula Hoops. Lead singer was Helen Shapiro. When the friends of that period grew apart and Helen Shapiro became a teenage star, Mark got into the clothes scene. The Life of Bo Brummel was one of the first books he got deeply into, and Mark had been a smart dresser from as early as nine. But at 13 he fell in with an older crowd from Stamford Hill for whom clothes had become a way of life. These were the early days of what was to ignite the whole mod cult and the Carnaby Street bonanza. Mark recalls. Visually, these cats were amazing. They were about 20 when I first knew them, but I decided that that was where I wanted to be. And by the time I was 14, I had the same sort of respect they had in the neighborhood. So strong became their reputation, spreading further afield than the immediate East End, that when the national press realized not only that mods existed but that they would make good copy, Mark and his friends were the people they went to. At 15, Town Magazine was devoting an article to Mark's wardrobe and his views. Mark claims that if you went around certain parts of the East End and mentioned Mark Feld, his real name, there would still be people who would remember. His obsession for clothes came to an end when the family moved to Wimbledon because according to Mark, nothing ever happened there. Mark said, after leaving school, I went into exile for two or three years, like Bo Mel had done. A living of about four pounds a week was made nicking records from second-hand record shops and selling them back. He also did a bit of male modeling for tailors like John Temple. And then, having learned how to play as well as pose with a guitar, with assistance from the Burt Whedon play in a day instructor, he set about breaking into music. He made demos for everyone and anyone. He failed an EMI recording test singing Betty Everett's You're No Good, and finally signed with Decca to cut his first solo single, The Wizard. Scarlet flashing in his eyes, the wizard turned and melted in the sky. Mark appeared on Ready Steady Go, promoting his single. He was 19 and making his first ever public appearance in front of 6 or 7 million people and he'd never sung before. I had no real idea how to sing, recalls Mark. I had only sung before in the studio when we made the record. I thought it would be easy. You just stood there and started singing and that was that. But for the child Bolan, who'd learnt all he knew from watching Cliff Richard in Summer Holiday, Elvis in Loving You, and Eddie Cochran in Untamed Youth, that wasn't that. The result, with the band starting late behind Mark and playing in a different key, was a fiasco. Mark was so embarrassed that he made a silent pledge to himself to really work at being a musician from that moment on. From that first abortive Ready Steady Go, he went again into a form of exile, cutting himself off from former friends and associates as well as Decca, to learn the art of songwriting. His difficulty was a lack of anywhere to play. The underground was non-existent and the choice for a solo performer singing his own songs with a guitar was either folk clubs or rag balls. Mark says, I knew that the kids were there though because they were buying Dylan records. It was with producer-manager Simon Napier-Bell that Bolan made his second solo record, Hippie Gumbo. Again, through friendship with what was then the elitist circle of the day, he was able to do a further Ready Steady Go promotion. I wasn't ashamed of that one, Mark says. Bolan remembers it primarily as the first unforgettable television appearance of Jimi Hendrix. It was, in fact, the last ever episode of Ready Steady Go. 
Despite his appearance on the show, the single sold about 200 copies. Napier Bell also managed a group called John's Children, who had had a minor hit with their first single, and they wanted a lead guitarist. Actually, they wanted Pete Townsend and I was the nearest equivalent thing he had under contract, Mark says. John's Children are probably best remembered for their single Desdemona. The single was Mark's song all the way through, and often looked back on as a source of encouragement when things looked black. When he finally split from John's Children because he didn't like the way their music was going, Mark started Tyrannosaurus Rex. It isn't commonly known that for a brief spell, they were a five-piece electric group. Mark had modeled them on Tomorrow, one of the most successful bands on the underground scene at the time, and they managed a few gigs at the Electric Garden, later Middle Earth. We didn't rehearse, recalls Mark. We didn't know about rehearsing. We thought you just went on and said, here are the songs. Big Rex had a short life, permanently stunted when track records repossessed the band's equipment. Bereft of his Gibson, Mark bought a £12 acoustic, with money his mother had given him. And with Steve Took, he set up the bopping duo. John Peel's assistance through his radio show Perfumed Garden and the duo's free gigs in Hyde Park aroused the initial interest and created the impetus. Before long, they were back at Middle Earth. Mark remembers. A fiver a night and a cab home to Wimbledon. That's what we got when we started. A cab home. Wow. That was really living. And now, let's go back to 1967 with John's children. John's children, who make their chart debut this week with their own composition Just What You Want, are described by their manager Simon Napier-Bell, also manager of the Yardbirds, as the first of the anti-lust groups. With the exception of lead guitarist Mark Boland from Wimbledon, the group all come from Leatherhead in Surrey, where they manage their own club, the Blue Set. Simon Napier, who enjoys sticking pins in the more self-righteous and exaggerated concept that the pop scene is now a hotbed of drugs immorality and degradation, declares the group a permanent thorn in pop pomposity. Simon told me. They have already had a hit in the US charts with Smash Blocked. I wrote it and it had nothing to do with drugs or drink. It was about illicit sex. We came down against it. The second of the group's anti-lust songs was one called Not the Kind of Girl You Take to Bed. This was an anti-drug song that Simon wrote. The song got turned down by the record company, who were apparently shocked any group should be so moral. Their next single is Remember Thomas Beckett. Simon said, We decided to play safe with this, and get right away from drugs and sex and into a good healthy murder. They wrote it themselves and it's all about a fella who goes mad and begins playing funerals in his back garden. On stage, the group all use Jordan equipment. It's especially made for them in the US, and only used by top American groups like the Mamas and the Puppers, and the Turtles. They wear white stage suits and gold medallions, although Simon is not sure why. Simon told me, I discovered John Hewlett, Chris Townsend and Andy Ellison in prison on a vagrancy charge, while I was on holiday in St. Tropez. You might say they were professional vagrants. I bailed them out and discovered they were a group and one of the conditions of my bailing anyone out is that they work for me for three years. I spoke to folk singer Mark Bolan, who lately replaced the lead guitarist, as they were rehearsing in London on Friday. Mark said, we are writing and arranging all our own material on stage. And although I still hope to record independently as a solo artist, as far as this group is concerned, Andy is lead and sings on the disc. Our club, the blue set, is a knockout. We choose all our artists, last night we had Graham Bond and next week Simon Dupree. Apart from Andy, who is 21, we all are 19. Simon describes his group as completely arrogant, cripplingly honest, totally naive, and four good clean healthy lads who sound like the Who, Blues Blues. A powerful sort of combination. <laughs> 